9, standing by. Red 2, standing by. Red 11, standing by. Red 5, standing by. Lock air spoils in attack position. For as long as video games have existed as consumer products, there have been games based on non-gaming franchises. Movies, television series, music, plays, and many more have all found their way into the medium of games. And while some go on to become coveted pieces of the video game industry's landscape, most quickly recede into the background. A lack of time, talent, and creative freedom condemns them to mediocrity, or worse. The Pirates of the Caribbean franchise was no exception. While far from the worst that the world of licensed games has to offer, the Pirates of the Caribbean video games, designed to quickly and cheaply cash in on the movie's releases, consistently failed to move the needle. While the 2007 video game tie-in for Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End offered surprisingly engaging voice performances and, for its time, decent graphics, its core gameplay had little to offer. But then, in 2009, a Vancouver-based development studio known as Propaganda Games would announce the development of a new Pirates of the Caribbean game, one without the star power of Johnny Depp or Kira Knightley. An ambitious project that would use the Pirates of the Caribbean universe as the canvas for an original set of characters, scenarios, and mechanics unfettered by the franchise's normal stalwarts. A swashbuckling adventure that, had it ever been released, might have stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best that the video game industry had to offer. This is the story of Pirates of the Caribbean, Armada of the Damned. Throughout the 80s and 90s, Disney occupied a fairly modest spot in the video game industry, its output consisting largely of educational titles and 2D platformers intended for younger audiences. Games like DuckTales, Mickey Mania, and The Lion King were neither revolutionary nor as popular as the animated features they were based on, but they nonetheless found a place in the hearts of many. Then, at the turn of the 21st century, things changed with the release of Kingdom Hearts. An action role-playing game developed by Square Enix, Kingdom Hearts cast players as Sora, a young adventurer that must travel across the Disney universe to save it from a looming and powerful threat. While not as esoteric as Square's Final Fantasy series, Kingdom Hearts was considerably darker and more emotionally charged than any prior Disney game. And, much to the surprise of Disney's higher-ups, it would end up being a massive commercial hit. While Disney's bread and butter would always be its kid-friendly content, Kingdom Hearts proved to the House of Mouse that there existed a market for games aimed at older players. As a result, Disney Interactive Studios, Disney's video game development and publishing wing, would establish numerous studios throughout the 2000s devoted to producing content aimed at older audiences. There was Black Rock Studio, which made a name for itself with racing games Pure and Split Second. There was Junction Point Studios, where former Ion Storm talents such as Warren Spector and Art Min worked on the dark action platformer Epic Mickey. And then there was Propaganda Games. Founded in 2005 by former EA Canada employees, Propaganda Games' first project had the 2008 reboot of the first-person shooter franchise, Turok. Taking place in the remote reaches of space, the title cast players as Joseph Turok, a disgraced corporal who must fight for survival on a dinosaur-infested planet. While the game received a lukewarm critical reception, it sold well enough to guarantee propaganda survival, prompting the studio to embark on three new titles. The first was a sequel to Turok that was quietly cancelled in 2009. The second was Tron Evolution, an action-adventure game set in the Tron universe that served as a prequel to 2010's Tron Legacy. And the third was Pirates of the Caribbean Armada of the Damned, an open-world role-playing game set in the Pirates of the Caribbean universe. Where previous Pirates of the Caribbean games existed almost solely to capitalize on the success of the movies, Armada of the Damned aimed to take advantage of the narrative and exploratory potential of the Pirates universe. It was an ambitious prospect, far larger in scope than what propaganda had attempted with Turok, but it had a great creative pedigree backing it, with Dan Tudge, who had previously directed Dragon Age Origins at Bioware, spearheading the project. Yeah. <laughs> 
Propaganda Games would formally announce Armada of the Damned for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC in May of 2009. Taking place before the events of the first movie, the game would follow the adventures of James Sterling, an aspiring young pirate whose dreams of fame and fortune are cut short when he is killed by the insane Admiral Maldonado. Tossed overboard, Sterling's lifeless body sinks to the ocean floor, where it is found by the undead crewmen of the mysterious Armada of the Damned. Sterling is resurrected by their leader and returned to the surface, where he embarks on a quest to find his fortune among the Seven Seas. Despite sharing its namesake, Armada of the Damned would have been largely bereft of the characters and storylines featured in the franchise's movies, with the exception of a few returning characters, such as the voodoo priestess Tia Dalma, and iconic haunts such as Port Royal and Tortuga, the game would have been its own beast, unshackled by the movies that preceded it. Even the game's soundtrack would have been largely original, with the movie's iconic themes only sampled sparingly. Armada of the Dam's gameplay would have borrowed heavily from contemporaneous role-playing games while possessing many features unique to itself. Like Dragon Age or Lionhead Studios' Fable, Armada would have featured an engaged story driven and transformed by player choice. At the beginning of the game, the player would have had to choose whether they wanted Sterling to be a legendary pirate or a dreaded pirate. A legendary pirate would seek fame and fortune and conduct their actions with an emphasis on showmanship and pizzazz, while a dreaded pirate would pursue power, living on the outskirts of society and steeping themselves in the supernatural to achieve their ambitions. This choice would have had a profound impact on nearly everything in the world of Armada, from Sterling's appearance to the game's combat and story. However, the player would still have the freedom to make many other decisions throughout their journey, regardless of their alignment, resulting in vastly different experiences. For example, an early quest in the game would have seen Sterling venture to the island of Opowiwatu in search of a figurehead to adorn his ship. Upon arriving, Sterling discovers that the island's inhabitants have been cursed by the very idol he seeks, transformed into mindless, crab-like monsters. After fighting his way through the island's enemies, Sterling is given the choice to carve a figurehead in his image and leave it behind, or take it for himself. If the player chooses the former, the island's curse would be lifted, and the island's inhabitants would worship Sterling as if he were a god. What? No. I'm not here to punish no one. Now, shh, go on. You are not sent to kill? Then if you're not sent to kill us, you are sent to save us! <laughs> if the player chooses the latter, Sterling would get what he originally came for, but permanently condemn the island to ruin. Armada of the Dam's combat would have featured a combination of grounded and supernatural moves. Sterling would be able to string together combos of light and heavy attacks with his weapon of choice, while being able to enfeeble his opponents with curses. And if Sterling managed to defeat a cursed opponent with a successful combo, their curse would then be transferred to all surrounding enemies. The more enemies Sterling defeated, the more abilities he would be able to unlock and upgrade, with the availability of certain abilities dependent on the player's narrative choices. A legendary Sterling, for example, would gain access to increasingly theatrical moves, such as being able to douse his opponents in rum and set them ablaze. Meanwhile, a dreaded Sterling would wield the very anchor that dragged his corpse to the ocean depths to pulverize his opponents. In between island capers, players would be able to freely explore the Caribbean Sea in Sterling's ship, the Nemesis. Players would be able to recruit crewmates to man the ship based on the choices they had made, which in turn would affect the Nemesis attributes. And if the player encountered another vessel while at sea, Sterling and his crew would be able to use cannons, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and even supernatural abilities to defeat and loot it. All the while, players would be able to choose whether to view the action from a distant perspective or right behind Sterling's shoulder. While many video games have since featured naval battles similar in style to what Armada of the Damned once promised, such as Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed IV Black Flag or Rare's Sea of Thieves, Armada would have preceded all of them had it ever been released. After generating only mild interest following its reveal in 2009, Armada of the Damned would explode in popularity upon being showcased at E3 2010. Critics praised the game's combat and the potential its story and narrative choices held, with many favorably comparing it to Fable 2. 
Some noted that the game felt a touch rough around the edges, but remained confident that it would receive the polish it deserved. With a scheduled release date of early 2011, propaganda seemed to have plenty of time to fine-tune it. But then, in October of 2010, a mere four months after the game's blowout at E3, Disney would announce the cancellation of Armada of the Damned, and with it, the layoff of much of Propaganda Games' staff. Propaganda's remaining employees would stay for the rest of the year to complete Tron Evolution, which would release in December to mixed reviews. And then, in January of 2011, Disney would close Propaganda Games altogether. Almost as quickly as Armada of the Damned had made its presence known, it and the entire studio responsible for it was gone. While an official reason for Armada of the Dam's cancellation was never provided, evidence suggests that its shuttering was largely a product of Propaganda Games soon after closure, which itself was caused by issues far beyond Propaganda's control. In the years following Propaganda's closure, all but a few of Disney's other console studios would follow suit, with BlackRock Studio closing in June of 2011 and Junction Point in January of 2013. According to the 2016 Polygon article, Disney's many, many attempts at figuring out the game industry by Wooly Clark, these mass closures were the result of a combination of factors. In addition to the economic downturn following the 2008 financial crisis and the rise of mobile games making Disney's console studios less valuable, most lacked the economic or creative leverage to justify their survival. To Howard Donaldson, the former vice president of studio operations at Disney Interactive, the House of Mouse was at fault for not having established its console studios more slowly. Quote, We were always, well, let's grow faster, let's create more studios. And I kind of felt that we should have gotten one studio right, and then maybe tried to create another one. Like Sony Santa Monica, or Naughty Dog, or DreamWorks. They do one game at a time, and it's a big blockbuster. Like BlackRock and Junction Point, Propaganda games possessed incredible talent, but lacked the clout or versatility it needed to justify its existence to Disney when the tides of the video game industry shifted. And while Armada of the Damned possessed immense potential, not everyone believed in the title's future prospects. In a June 2016 episode of the Kinda Funny Gamecast, John Vignocchi, who had helped manage the development of Armada as a development director at Disney Interactive, would reveal that its identity as a licensed game plagued it in the lead up to its cancellation. I remember like, you know, text messaging any journalist that was there, you know, as part of that yeah. group that would listen and everyone's like, yeah, it's cool. But at the same time, like we're kind of nervous because, you know, it's like a licensed thing and is the company really going to get into it? And um, and that was one of the things that was like, look, I mean, even even some of the journalists are a bit worried about, you know, how this is going to turn out. Yeah. In the wake of Armada of the Dam's demise, the game's score would actually be reused for Lego Pirates of the Caribbean which would release in May of 2011. Following that, the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise would see itself represented in Disney's Toys to Life series, Disney Infinity, with toys based on Captain Jack Sparrow, Davy Jones, and Hector Barbossa releasing alongside the game's launch in August of 2013. Then, in May of 2016, Disney would announce that it was canceling support for Disney Infinity and pulling out of developing video games internally altogether while external development studios, such as EA Dice and Square Enix, continue to develop console games based on their most coveted properties, Disney's days of cultivating studios such as Propaganda appear to be over, for now. While we may never know whether Pirates of the Caribbean Armada of the Damned would have lived up to its potential, its enduring popularity, both during and after its cancellation, cannot be understated. And although the game's cancellation did not directly lead to the creation of a better game from its ashes, there is little doubt that the litany of pirate-themed games that emerged in the years following took inspiration from its design. Armada is proof that with the proper time and care, any property, even one previously mired in mediocre tie-in games as Pirates of the Caribbean, can become something truly special and influential. A treasure waiting to be found deep within the sea. Our work is made possible by the generous support of our patrons. If you enjoy our content, consider subscribing to our channel and checking us out on Patreon. Thank you.